This is Jane Siegfried, convener of the podcast, Views and Voice Above the Noise, hosted by MASA, Minnesota Association of School Administrators. Today's podcast is an interview with Dr. Brenda Caselius, Commissioner of Education for the State of Minnesota. Dr. Caselius has held the position for the past eight years, which makes her the state school officer with the second longest term in office except for Tony Evers in Wisconsin, who has been in his position about a year longer. Later in the podcast, she will talk about why there is such a turnover in this position across the United States. She has been a teacher, a building administrator, and superintendent in Minnesota and Tennessee, so she brings a wide-angle lens to her position. I know I use camera analogies often, but I think they fit. During the podcast, you will hear several themes in Brenda's leadership. First and foremost, she operates through the lens, there's the camera thing again, of what is good for the kids of Minnesota, and she means all kids. Looking at schools, whether it's business practices, transportation, curriculum adoption, achievement, discipline referrals, and so on, they are all viewed through the equity lens. The 10 equity commitments for the state is a living document for her. In addition, you will hear how Brenda is a listening leader. In examining issues and reaching decisions, she deliberately brings together many voices so that decisions are made with broad input. She is keenly aware of the political nature of her job and education in general, her work with the governor where she sits on his cabinet, plus her awareness of the politics of local schools with school boards, and the legislature itself is a constant presence in her role. She discusses some of her political interactions. Her collaborative style is apparent in her language where she talks about the work of the State Department as we, not I. You will hear that in several places in the podcast. So let's start. Well, it's interesting because I'm the second longest serving chief in the nation now. It's really um, interesting. Tony Evers is the Wisconsin chief and he's actually running for governor now, and he is the longest serving chief, and I'm second longest serving. He's got about a year on me. So uh, it's been quite an honor, and I've just been uh, so blessed to have this opportunity to serve the children of Minnesota. And um, when I meet other chiefs, you know, they've been in their roles just one or two years, and I've been in my role now almost eight years. So I've had the great opportunity of looking back and kind of seeing some of the struggles and some of the um, difficult parts of, of really trying to embed a, an equity agenda in the state and then uh, also trying to impact that on a national level as well. So I had the good fortune of sitting on the CCSSO board um, and help lead my state school chief officers and work with Tony and the board on setting equity commitments at the mm-hmm. national level as well. So we have these 10 equity commitments that we ask all chiefs to use, and um, so I'm just very proud of, of our focus on that. I remember the very first superintendent's conference that I went to, and there just wasn't anything about equity or achievement gaps or about kids of color or or all students. It was mostly math and science and standards and assessments. And, you know, there's just so much more to educating our kids than that. And, um, you know, I'm glad where we're at now. And I'm glad that in Minnesota we can usually move through um, tough issues and lean in rather than have a lot of rancor about things, whereas and some of my other colleagues and chiefs in other states have had really the struggle with Common Core, or they've had the struggle with their assessment systems and their standards and their standard development, or they're having difficulty with developing, you know, transparent report cards or teacher evaluation or what, you know, their, their Every Student Succeeds Act plans or their waivers uh, from No Child Left Behind. And we just haven't had any of that. So we've been able to really work through some of the more difficult uh, aspects of school accountability and support uh, in Minnesota because I think people are more willing to work together. And so for, for me, I think it's been just about getting people to the awareness stage and then moving them beyond action. Um, and so I'm just very proud of, of where we've come. Um, and, and I think the foundation that we, the Dayton administration has been able to build. I asked her why she thought Minnesotans were different from what she'd heard from the chief officers in other states. One, I think 
think people realize we have large achievement gaps and we need to do something about it. So I think that there is this general sense of we're no longer going to make excuses. And so we, we better get into this together. The demographic in Minnesota is shifting rapidly. Mm-hmm. And I think uh, Minnesotans have always dug in uh, and problem solved together historically um, outside of the political winds. I mean, we're a fairly purple state. You know, I mean, we do um, believe in Minnesota nice that you do try to um, work with your neighbor and, and do well by your neighbor. And I think that there's a general uh, sense that people want to take care of one another in their communities. And as they see you know, new faces coming to their communities and um, there's this kind of um, desire to just dig in and, and get it done. She's been in office longer than other chief state school officers except Wisconsin. I wondered if Minnesota was different in that aspect as well. One, I'm appointed. Right. So, uh, you know, that's a, a real blessing, I think, because I'm then in alignment with the governor. So that in itself get, lends itself to a really um, cohesive and aligned agenda. Um, in terms of state agency, in terms of priorities for the for the the state, in terms of you know the people elected, you know the governor to govern the state, and then he gets to pick his cabinet members, and so I think that makes it easier to stay longer. And then he ran again, and so because he ran again, and um, then um, he he picked um, public minded people who were practitioners. And I think that was really smart of the governor mm-hmm. to pick practitioners who had kind of a, um, a core mission, like all my colleagues in the, on the cabinet have an incredible core mission of the work that they do in helping the people of Minnesota. I mean, uh, many of these folks came out of really successful careers as doctors or lawyers or uh, uh, judges or politicians, you know, not politicians, because he really didn't have any politicians on his um, cabinet until Larry Lush- um, Larry uh, Pogamiller uh, joined up um, a few years into it. But... Um, and I think that's helped because we all know our field so well. Um, and it's helped us to really have a strong empathy at, from the people that we serve. So, for instance, I was a teacher. I was a school principal and a school superintendent. So I know what I would want to have from an, a state agency and the level of support. And so I was able then to, I hope, um, transform the agency so that it was a, a, an agency that was more about service to our educators um, and families and children than it was of just, you know, can you fill out, you know, this paperwork or, com- you know, compliance-driven. Um, whereas I think other state chiefs, they're elected. Um, or, you know, so they could, they, you know, they go at the whim of the election. So if you deal with media issues like the No Child Left Behind waiver or you're changing your common core standards and whatever the political winds of the day are, you know, they can then be thrown out. Um, also, there's a lot of controversy that comes when you're trying to make change, and, and tr- especially if you're trying to adopt an equity agenda. Uh, you have to be able to navigate through all of that. And if you come and you're not from an education background and you can't speak to teachers and educators, then I think it can be tougher to stay in those positions because they then become quite controversial. And then sometimes you either end up resigning or the, you know, the state board ends up you know, eliminating your position, um, you know, or in, in a couple states you term out, you know, you can serve two terms, um, so there's uh, chiefs who term out, um, but we'd like to see them be able to stay a little bit longer, because I think it really does help a state when you can see the continuity of, of your policies and your funding decisions and then see the results of that over time because it takes several decades to really shift a statewide system um, and, and see generational change. What are some of the challenges that face the State Department in the future? Well, I've already talked about, you know, our achievement gap, our big challenges. Um, I think also the challenge just continues to try to bring people together around common sense policies. Uh, you know, oftentimes we, we agree on the goal of what we want to get done, but it's the means to get us there. And so 
Uh, it was disappointing this session that we weren't able to move an education bill through um, because of the politics and the nature of creating a big bill. And so that's not a good sign for Minnesota that we are uh, stalling uh, forward progress because of politics. And so I hope that that was just like a one-off <laughs> and we're able to continue to find ways to move forward for our kids and for educators because we are now, I think, on a cusp of where school districts really not only are aware and recognize the importance of cultural competence and equity, but they're actually willing to do something about it and to change their practices and to change their routines and to be able to do real good, uh, broad stakeholder engagement and I'd hate to see that momentum um, be lost. I asked, what were some of the accomplishments of her tenure? In her answer, you will hear several of her guiding principles, such as the we before I, the attribution of efforts to many people, not just herself, the awareness of the politics of education, and several great leadership quotes which she attributes to her learning from the governor. Well, I've not made any, but we've made a lot. You know, I give the governor a lot of credit for allowing me to be, uh, he used to say, you know, I'd say, Governor, how, how bold can I be? And he'd say, okay, Brenda, you can be bold, but don't be reckless. And so I've taken that with me now as a leadership lesson, you know, that you move forward boldly, but that you're not reckless about it and that you bring people along, um, that you do it in the right time frames um, and that you can't, you can't push um, that you, you know, you can't bulldoze change. You have to be willing to, to go about it when people are ready. And I really feel like educators are fine. You know, they're, it's not that they're finally ready. I mean, everybody's been doing it hit or miss here, you know, but I feel like systemically as a, as an entire state that together we're getting it now, you know, where you'd have these stars, you know, around the state who would be doing these great things. And now I feel like, People are sharing much more intentionally in their regions. Um, superintendents are working together more intentionally. And so that's all going to be good for kids uh, in the end. And so I think that um, that's something I'm really proud of that we've been able to move. And then, of course, there's these wins, you know, these big legislative wins. You know, we paid back the school shift. You know, we were borrowing money from schools, and now the governor has worked with the legislature to establish a really strong reserve uh, so that there's a pot of money in our reserve so that we're not going to be in the position of having to borrow from schools. Um, so that's really good. And the governor has um, worked with the legislature to pay back all of the old money, $2.8 billion. You know, and that's good. He made that a priority. Most people don't know he's really kind of fiscally conservative. You know, I mean, he'd always say, come to the table with efficiencies too you know don't just come asking for money um so you know that's one thing i appreciated about him and he also always was everybody deserves to be listened to um and there's all good ideas at the table none of us is smart as all of us and that we have to you know the, the best idea will run run away with it it's not that it's an r idea or a d idea it's that it's the best idea and so he was always a really good uh, listener and is currently you know you know a great listener um and so all of the early childhood stuff you know with the funding stuff has been something with twenty five thousand more kids in early you know state-based preschool you know all kids now have uh, all-day kindergarten and only 50% of kids had all-day kindergarten before so we know that kids will have a better shot at getting a great start to their education which is amazing and so we're not going to see those results now that'll be you know years down the road that we'll see those and so the the courage of the governor to invest so heavily in early learning when he knew that he wouldn't get the political gain from that uh, you know, it'll be some other leader later taking the credit, you know, but it'll be because of these early investments in the foundation and equity uh, that is going to be why we see change in the next decade. Most politicians will be looking for what can I do so I'll get reelected or what can I do so that my legacy looks good. He never cared about any of that. What he cared about was the people of Minnesota and making sure that children had what they need to be good little citizens and be successful in life. What are some of the differences you've seen in focusing the equity lens during your tenure as commissioner? The demographics of the entire state are shifting quickly, but I do think it's because of the governor's leadership on inclusivity 
And um, I do think it's because of our demanding, you know, and everything that we do talking about equity um, and keeping it front and center um, and putting it in our accountability systems. And, you know, we've done a ton in funding. We funded EL for uh, seven years instead of five years. We have a special revenue called American Indian Education Revenue. We did the equalization for the BIE schools so that they were given the same exact pay as, uh, or same exact funding as every other kid. We were able to restore the integration program, which was sunsetted under the um, legislature during the shutdown. They they demanded that they eliminate the integration revenue program, and we brought that back. Um, and so, you know, those are things that were we brought down the disparity by doing the board approved referendums for those districts that didn't have referenda, so that you know rural districts and small schools revenue uh, and more equalization, and so that that brought the disparity between your wealthiest districts and your not so wealthy districts from thirty one percent to eighteen percent today. Wow. And so, I mean, there's just that. Equity lens has always been front and center. Um, we we brought down this cross subsidy uh, and changed the way that we calculate special ed funding going out, and so uh, their school districts are getting more funding for special education, especially for uh, those disabilities where they they are very complex and they they need a lot of services. So those cost a lot of fun, uh, money. So now school districts are getting more money for that, as well as putting an additional forty million into. Um, uh, special education to buy that cross subsidy down. Um, so there's just so many things around equity, not only just in the policies um, and the LEAPS Act and the uh, English Language Learner Act or our federal accountability systems and how we focused it on equity um, and our American Indian education and our early childhood. I mean, there's just there's so much over the eight years that we've been able to accomplish, and I think that's why it's so good for states to find ways to keep more permanency um, for their their state leaders uh, if their state leaders are showing and, and producing things that are going to actually create the conditions in which children and families can succeed. Many people link mental health issues and school violence as though the lack of mental health in our kids is the main contributor to school violence, especially to school shootings. Here is the commissioner's take on the cause and effect of those issues. This one area that we have some good bipartisan support on is around mental health and opioid abuse and child abuse and uh, some of those more social issues. You don't usually get too much uh, dissonance happening between the two political parties with with those issues, you know. So that's really good. And so if we can find s solutions to those uh, really uh, huge dilemmas for us, that would be good. Um, as for schools and mental health um, and and school safety, you know, I, our kids are troubled, um, but I don't think that the reason we have unsafe schools is because of mental health issues. Um, so I think we have unsafe schools because kids have access to guns. And I think that until, we're, until we are ready to start dealing with our gun problem, we will always, no matter how many mental health counselors we have, we will always have a school safety issue. I'm done having the rhetoric around mental health and that our kids are stressed. Um, yes, our kids are stressed. Yes, they need more mental health supports, but kids are not... Um, violently acting out uh, with knives or with, you know, uh, with whatever. Um, they're grabbing these AR-15 warlike guns that should not be on the streets. And I'm surprised that we can't get agreement around this because our police force des deserves their respect. Um, they do not need to be working in environments where they feel unsafe because of these war uh, weapons that are out on the street and putting their lives in danger. Um, and we should all be behind our police, our police, our sheriffs, you know, our ambulance personnel, our teachers, um, our hospital personnel. It's, it's just ridiculous to me that we are unwilling as a nation. In other nations, Australia had some mass, mass murders happen, and they banned assault weapons, and they have not had these kinds of atrocities. We're the only nation in the world that has this level of atrocity by these uh, access to these kinds of weapons. You know, people can have divided opinions. 
Um, but I think we all have the same goal that all children should feel safe at school. And as long as these weapons are out there, we will not have safe schools. The commissioner has ideas for what we can do to ensure school safety, and she has suggestions for dealing with mental health issues. Anybody wants metal detectors, right? So I think we need to have secure doors. We need to have secure entrances. Um, we need to have really strong protocols and safety protocols and uh, drills that are practiced and that everybody understands how to stay calm, how to mitigate the emergencies that happen at your school, whether it's a health emergency or whether it's a weather emergency or whether it's an intruder emergency, uh, that we understand and know how to do that. And we practice with law enforcement and, and um, know how to, how to manage um, and mitigate any time that something like that would happen. Um, is, as for mental health, um, you know, I agree that kids should not um, be uh, stressed as much as they are stressed, that they should not feel like a number out of school, that they should be connected and have relationships. So building strong school cultures is really important, that people feel like a family, that if they feel trouble, that they have a place that they can go and get help. Uh, we could have more nurses and social workers in buildings to help families and, and to work on students' um, uh, health and wellness, all around health and wellness. Um, you know, sometimes kids are uh, medicated and they have different medications that impact their uh, behavior. And without a nurse in the school, how do they know and understand those symptoms when something's gone wrong or when the child hasn't taken their medication? Um, special ed services and making sure we have very well-trained uh, um, teachers to understand all of the unique disabilities that children present with and that they have uh, specialized training in that. You know, I'm a little worried about our new Tier 1 license Mm -hmm. system uh, that allows folks in a shortage area, and there's always a shortage area in special education, that uh, our students with disabilities will get less effective teachers and less teachers who are prepared to really understand that child's disability and be able to know the strategies to work through some of that. And this is really with Sandy's, mm -hmm. um, you know, particular uh, situation with students who come with very complex needs, uh, historical trauma, uh, significant mental health issues, um, cognitive disabilities, um, impulse control defiant disorders, those kinds of things, you know, th things that these kids have seen that none of us could even dream that they would, that a child would see um, and how that impacts that child. Um, so you need really wraparound services. You need health professionals, doctors, nurses. You need social workers for family uh, counseling and family support systems to be put in place. You need uh, support systems for the child themselves. And, and, and then you need, then we're still trying to educate them. You know, um, and so you need teachers and licensed teachers who are prepared and understand how to get them ready uh, academically so that they can be successful in life. One of the concerns I have heard is that it is difficult to share information among various agencies, such as police officers, mental health agencies, medical facilities, and schools, and so on. The ability to share information across entities is crucial in order to provide coordinated care for some of our students. Commissioner Caselius has a remedy for that. We have a form where they waive their rights to data privacy. Yeah, the families, they, yes. when they come and they enroll, that they waive their right to, you know, you're very specific about what they're waiving, so they're, very, they're knowledgeable, it's very transparent, but you have a waiver, just like, um, you know, I'm a caregiver for my parents, mm -hmm. and they're elderly, and so I can, I had my dad authorize me to be able to make his appointments, to get access to his medical records, to make decisions for them, you know, and they could do all of these legal waivers, um, and then have the families and the child sign these legal waivers especially if the child's 18, because they do have a lot of students who are older, um, and you sign these these waivers, and then every, the agencies are all on it, and it goes into a, a data bank that allows you to have this data sharing between, the, and you have uh, limitations to what that what can be done with the data so that there's protections, you know, that they're only for the use of these particular practitioners who will be providing wraparound services to this family or this child. So why don't we do this? And I don't know if it, because it's just the grand scale of it's just so huge to think about it statewide to do something like that. 
Um, but if I was, you know, superintendent in a district, I'd want to develop this form, speak to my lawyers, and work with my social workers and the county to be able to know what services students are getting and then be able to gather that data and share data about these families and support systems. I asked Commissioner Casalius what she would do with education if she had a magic wand and could make a wish for the future. She leaves us with a wish for our superintendents. If I had a, a little wish, it would be that superintendents um, and school boards would act on the autonomies that they have to do everything possible that they could do for kids. Um, oftentimes, because we've been with No Child Left Behind for the past, you know, 20 years, um, that people just really are not willing to take a risk and they're not willing to go outside the box. And so I'd really like for our school leaders to begin to think differently about how we deliver public education for kids. In conclusion, in the spirit of the commissioner's closing comments, Dr. Seuss, my favorite profound philosopher, had this to say, think, you can think anything that you wish. If you have any thanks for me, my email is jlsigford at comcast.net. Thanks for listening.